Hi guys, welcome back or welcome to my channel, Knee Knits. My name is Amy and today we have a December knitting podcast. I'm gonna share with you guys everything that I knit for Christmas as well as updates on a few of my projects and share with you some new yarn and knitting plans that I have. I hope you had a happy holiday season. If you celebrated Christmas, I hope that you had a great Christmas. It's been quite the month for me, full of knitting gifts for other people, as well as updating my shop. I do sell finished hats and other knit items on Etsy. So a lot of my winter, you know, November, December knitting is focused on things for other people and for the shop. So I do have a lot to share with you guys. I'll start with what I'm wearing in today's episode. So this is my polo sweater. It's a free pattern by Caitlin Barthold of Originally Lovely. I knit this earlier in the fall and it's made out of Lion Brand Superwash Merino in the color Mushroom. And yeah, great pattern. I talked a lot about this in one of my previous podcasts, so I'll link that up above if you haven't seen it yet. And I've really been loving this sweater. I've been wearing it a lot. It's really lightweight. It's a DK weight knit, maybe more of a lightweight DK knit. So great staple piece. And I just love the collar detail. So yeah, that's what I'm wearing. But let's get into what I finished this month. So we're going to start with one project that I briefly introduced in my last podcast, and that is the Shift by Andrea Mowry. It is a mosaic knit cowl, and I finished it. So this is my Shift Cowl by Andrea Mowry. I believe the complete pattern name is called The Shift, and it is this beautiful mosaically knit piece. Now mosaic knitting is when you slip stitches and it creates this sort of, you know, color work effect that's not necessarily like stranded color work. And it's knit in three separate balls of self-striping yarn. So I use the Shopple Wool Zour Ball Edition 3, which is a self-striping 100% wool ball of yarn. So using the three different colors really creates this gorgeous effect that you can't really predict how it's going to look until you knit it up. And I got the inspiration for this project when I went to a local yarn store during the Greater Boston Yarn Crawl. I was at a garden for knitters in North Andover, Massachusetts, and they had a piece of this on display in their shop. And I was like, wow, I really want to make that even though it's totally out of my normal range of what I knit. So I grabbed the yarn for it. I got three different balls of the self-striping yarn and I have the color names for you guys if you're interested in, you know, replicating the exact color combos. So I used 2329, which is Beach Cafe, and it's kind of hard to show the individual colors in the cowl because it is, you know, intertwined with the different colors, but the Beach Cafe yarn is this more orangey yellow and light blue that starts at the top here. And then I also use color 2442 called Third Class. And that is more of these like purple green, I believe. And then I also use 2471, which is mineral resources, which, you know, it's more prevalent down here. I'll try and put some thumbnails of the actual color balls of yarn over here so you guys can see. But yeah, really fun project. I knit this up so quickly. I just had a lot of fun knitting it. I always had to have the pattern open next to me because you know, there's a lot going on. Each section is a little bit different in terms of the stitching. It is knit flat and it's knit on the bias. So I actually cast on, now this is seamed, but my cast on point was right here, like this lighter yellow color. And so I was knitting in this direction. You can see how the stripes go that way. So I was knitting flat in this direction and you increase on either side for a while and then you change the rate of the increases to sort of create this trapezoid shape. No, it's more of a, one, two, three, four. It's more of a hexagonal shape. And again, I'll put a little picture of what it looks like when it's done being knit flat. So it's a hexagon with a point that sits in the middle and then you seam up the two sides. And because it's knit on the bias, that's how you get these diagonal stripes. Really cool construction, really like keeps you motivated to knit the project and see it to the end. It also has some applied I-cord edging as well as I-cord bind off, which I think really completes the look. 
And I keep talking about this. I'm not even wearing it. So I'll try it on for you guys and show you how it looks styled. So yeah, super cute cowl. I actually wore this out yesterday. I went into Boston for the day and you know, when it's paired with a coat, it looks really nice. I think it's a really fun pop of color. It kind of will match anything because it has like every color of the rainbow for the most part. And I think the point is really sophisticated. You know, I can wear it more to the side like this or I could wear it more towards the front. It's very warm because it is 100% wool and it's a sport weight yarn. I didn't mention that before, but it is knit on 3.75 millimeter needles, which I believe is US size, US size five needles. So even though it's smaller needles, it went by super quickly. Andrea Maori has sort of like a collection of patterns that use the self-striping yarn combination with the mosaic knitting. She has, I believe, a larger shawl that is kind of like a, the same thing as this, just larger. She also has a sweater that uses this style. It's like a beautiful circular yoked sweater. I think it's called Shifty. Shifty is the name of the pattern. So super cool. I may put that on my list to knit, even though, again, I'm not really big on color work, but it just seems really fun. I really like the blended effect that the mosaic knitting has on the finished product and really enjoyed it. Some new techniques I learned with this was the knitting on the bias, as well as I-cord bind off and I-cord edging. Super simple when it's written out in the pattern, so new technique to me, but was super easy to learn. And yeah, I had a lot of fun with this and can't wait to wear it some more this winter. Okay, now I'm gonna get into what I finished this month for Christmas gifts. And I'm basically dubbing this like my sock miss because I decided to make socks for some of my family members and friends as Christmas gifts, you know, kind of diving into sock knitting this year and having a lot of fun with it. And I have all of the socks here. So I'll go through each of them one by one. You may recognize this color palette if you watched my last podcast or like at least look at the thumbnail. All those skeins of yarn from Sorella yarn that I got and talked about, I turned into socks. So I'll go through each pattern that I made with them. So the first pair that I made was the Scattered Pearl Socks. Now I have a pattern bundle from Summer Lee Design Co. And it is a pattern bundle of four different sock patterns. So two of the sock patterns that I made are from that pattern bundle. This is one of them. They're called the Scattered Pearl Socks. I'll show them up close. So it uses just knit and purl stitches to create this nice texture. It's a top-down sock and it has a afterthought heel. And I knit this in the Sorella yarn that I got from the Fall Tonals collection or the Autumn Tonals collection. This is the color Cashmere, which is this beautiful tonal mauve color. You can see the slight variegation combined with the textured stitches really makes the sock pop. And for the heel and toe accent, I used some leftover Filcolana Arweta Classic in the color medium gray. Now this is a top-down sock, like I said before, and the afterthought heel was a new technique to me. So basically I knit the sock as a tube. So you knit the sock straight or in the round, and then you put in sort of a working piece of scrap yarn at the midpoint where you want the heel to go, and then you continue knitting in the round until you close off for the toe and then you go back hence why it's called an afterthought heel you go back you take out the waste yarn that you threaded through the stitches before and then you knit the heel the same exact way that you knit the toe so new technique to me i think in general like it wasn't hard to do but i didn't really enjoy it that much it was just it felt like an extra finishing step you know after i was close to completing the sock, you have to like go back and add the heel. Whereas if you do a top down sock with like a heel flap construction, you know, once you get to the toe of the sock and finish off, you're done with the sock. You don't have to go back. So in terms of the afterthought heel, I'm not the biggest fan, although it does look really nice. And I think it is probably the best way to add like a contrasting color to a sock heel because of that like really clean shape. And I'll show it up close. Another thing I didn't really love about the afterthought heel is the join with, ooh, and sorry, my nail polish is chipped, but the join to the actual body of the sock is not the neatest. And I really 
don't know how I could have closed that up besides taking an extra piece of the yarn afterwards and sort of, you know, stitching that closed. But because you're picking up the stitches from the middle of the sock, it just sort of pulls and you can sort of see the line pulling like along the sock like that. So I wasn't a huge fan of that. If you have experience with afterthought heels and know how to prevent, you know, that sort of stretching in the middle and those wonky picked up stitches, let me know. I'll happily take any tips. So I knit these with the Sorella sock yarn and I knit them on 1.5 needles, which is 2.5 millimeter needles, even though the pattern calls for US size one needles. I just didn't have US size one needles, so the one and a halfs we're going to do. And I knit the size medium, which is 64 stitch cast on. And yeah, big fan of these socks. I really like the end result. I did block them. I like to block all my socks. They always look so much better after they've had like a nice soak and dry on the blockers. Okay, so the next pair of socks that I made from the Hello Sailor sock set pattern bundle is the Gersney socks. Now I only have one here because I actually haven't finished the second one. I'm hoping to finish it soon. But this sock pattern is inspired by classic Gersney sweaters that have a lot of texture and cables. And I knit this in the Sorella Autumn Tonals color called Butterscotch. And I love this sock. It looks so cool. It was my first time doing cables on socks. And in the pattern, the designer suggested using a toothpick as a cable needle. So I have my toothpick here. That's what I used to do the cables. I didn't think they were too difficult. At first I was trying to use the toothpick as the cable needle and I was knitting the stitches off the toothpick and I had some issues just because of how pointy the toothpick was. It was kind of like stabbing my finger in an uncomfortable way. And I was also afraid of the toothpick breaking because my cables were a little on the tighter side and I was pulling on the stitches and I didn't want to break the toothpick. So what I actually ended up doing was using the toothpick to hold the stitches as I moved them for the cable, but I would put them back on the actual knitting needle before I knit them just to prevent any issues with possibly breaking the toothpick or hurting my fingers in the process. So the cables were a little finicky and it definitely slowed down my progress on the sock. Like this takes a lot longer than like a plain vanilla sock or it took a lot longer than this sock which has just knit and purl stitches. But overall the end result is stunning. I also made a size medium here which is a 64 stitch cast on. This one has a traditional slip stitch heel flap construction and I just really like the look. I think that the garter stripes really pull together the sock. You know, they only continue on the top of the sock. And when the sock is worn, you'll sort of see it from this point of view, so. And then the butterscotch color is really nice. You can just see the slight variegation from the tonal. I did knit this on US size one knitting needles. So after I finished these ones, I did get a hold of some US one needles. And I do like the stitch definition and like the tightness of the gauge on the US ones compared to the US one and a halfs. It's crazy how a quarter of a millimeter in diameter change can affect the gauge significantly, but these definitely feel a lot sturdier and not as like loosely knit as the other ones. However, I did find this one to fit a lot tighter than the ones knit on the one and a half to the point where I'm a little worried that these might be too tight for the recipient to put on. We have sort of a similar foot size, I believe. So I was trying them on myself and it was tight getting over the ankle. So we'll see when they try them on if they fit. If not, I don't know, maybe I'll re-knit them or knit them a different pair of socks that is a little bit bigger, either on the one and a half size needles or make a size up with 72 stitch cast on. So TBD on if these are gonna fit, they do seem a little tight, but I do know socks stretch out over time, so it is helpful to have them on the tighter side to begin with, just to make sure that they stay snug over time and don't get too loose and don't move around that much. So these are the Gersney sweater socks. So the other two pairs of socks I made are from a different pattern, and I made the Bear Paw socks by Andrea Mowry, and they are a DK weight version of her everyday socks pattern, which is a ribbed sock, a two by two ribbed sock that is knit toe up and has a flegal heel. And I made one pair for my mom in the Sorella yarn cashmere DK. This is the color velvet from the autumn tonals. 
this really nice sort of bright but deep blue and you can still see the variegation you know it has lighter spots and darker spots so let's talk about the sock construction. So lots of new techniques learned when I knit these socks. So these are knit toe up, which is totally new to me. I've never done a toe up sock and it uses the Turkish cast on, which is really simple. I feel like it sounded complicated when I first looked it up and was, but when I was trying it and following along the tutorial video, it was super easy and it creates this really clean join at the toe. I don't even know if you can tell where it is. You might be able to see where it is, but in general, it's kind of like the same look to the, the Kitchener stitch, which is a bind off, but this is a cast on. So cast it on and then you do increases for the toe instead of decreases. And I actually messed up on this pair. I did increases without any knit rounds in between. So my toe is like half as long as it should have been. And I didn't realize that till I was knitting the second sock, but I wanted the socks to match, so I had to do the second sock the same incorrect way, but it didn't really affect the overall sock. You know, it just meant that my like foot part of the sock was longer than probably it should have been. But it's knit in this beautiful two by two rib, and then you do gusset increases, and this is the Flegel heel. So I'll show you guys the Flegel heel. This is the shape that it makes. It's sort of a triangular shape. Let me try and like stretch this out. The whole heel is knit in just stockinette and not ribs. You can see the difference in her pattern. She uses a contrasting color, but I just decided to make the sock all in one color. And I thought it was super easy. There's no holes at all. And the join is really smooth. And supposedly the flegal heel is supposed to be like more anatomically correct compared to like a heel flap. So I really liked this heel construction. It was super easy to follow in the directions, super clean look in the end. I would love to knit another one of these with the contrasting heel color because I think that would just look really nice. And I think the increases with the rib pattern just look really nice as well, you know, complementing the heel shape. And after you get past the heel, you just continue working in the two by two rib. So for the bind off, I used Jenny's surprisingly stretchy bind off because I wanted to make sure that there were no issues putting on the socks. The surprisingly stretchy bind off is really nice, practically speaking. I don't love how it looks. It definitely looks like less neat than other bind offs. I'm a huge fan of tubular bind off just because of how clean it looks. I have not learned a two by two rib tubular bind off yet, so I didn't do that here. I just did the surprisingly stretchy cast off where you use an extra yarn over in between every cast off stitch and that provides extra yarn in the cast off which gives that that extra stretch so yeah that's how I finished off the sock this is blocked this sock does look super funny before it's blocked because all of that two by two ribbing just compresses on itself where you have the stockinette pieces you know they don't really compress on itself like ribbing so you just have a really wonky looking sock so I was super excited to finish these and get them soaked and on the blockers just so I could make the finished product more presentable you can see I still have all these socks with me I haven't gifted them yet but over the next few days I will be giving them away so I'm looking forward to you know packaging them up I have some cute little cardboard boxes that I'll fold them up neatly and put them in and you know do wrapping paper bow and all that stuff so so for the last pair of socks that i made i made a matching pair of bear paw socks for my dad so the same pattern much larger size oh i don't know if i mentioned so for these socks i did the size six in the pattern which is advertised as a woman's size small um should fit women's shoe sizes four through six so that was this size and this is the men's largest size in the pattern, which is overall the largest size that the pattern is written for, which I believe will fit US shoe sizes for men, size 12 to 14. So these are for my dad. I wanted to make sure that he had extra room and they weren't too tight in any way, so I just went with the largest size. So these took way longer than obviously the smaller size. One thing I did not realize when I was 
deciding to cast on these socks is that when you get into the, I believe the second largest and the largest size in the pattern, they actually call for two 100 gram skeins of DK weight yarn. And I only had one. So you can see that these are ankle socks and they're not like half socks like these. I just did not have enough yarn. I literally used the whole skein of yarn. This is the Sorella Yarn Autumn Tonals Cashmere DK in the color Home. Now I just want to talk about this color because out of all of the Sorella Autumn Tonals that I had ordered, this is my favorite. I mean, look at that color. So this is like a deep earthy green. There is a ton of irrigation, but none of it like pools. It doesn't stripe. It's just stunning. And I would love to make a sweater in this color. Like it just looks so nice. And from afar, it's very like, it's very cool and calm and it's just a really nice color. So I'll have to wait till next autumn to order it because <laughs> they're only out seasonally. But so same thing, these are the bear paw socks, you know, same construction. You can see here, I did the correct amount of toe rounds. So the toe is a lot longer than the other pair that I made. When I made the first sock, I actually made the foot part of the sock way too long. So by the time I finished the heel, this sock was so long, like comically long. Like I don't think it would fit anyone's foot. It was huge. So I decided to just um, wrap up the stitches in a piece of waist yarn. And then I cast on the second sock and I made it a lot shorter. It's funny because you have to knit from the toe to the gusset increases and you sort of have to estimate when is a good time to make the gusset increases. And for the larger size, you can see there's a lot of increases here that in addition to adding width adds a lot of length. So you can see that at this point here is where I started the gusset increases. So when they're on my needles, you know, I was only looking at a sock that was this long, which in my mind just seemed way too short to be starting the gusset increases. So I just have a hard time visualizing how sizing actually works. So that's why on the first sock I kept knitting because this just seemed way too short of like a length for a sock. So I kept knitting and then I did the gusset increases and then it was like way too long. So on the second sock, I corrected it. I think this should fit pretty well. We'll find out when I give them to my dad and he tries them on. You know, I'm willing to redo them if they have like a really wonky fit. But you do get a lot of leeway with the two by two rib just because of how stretchy it is. It is going to fit a little bit better. You have more like play there than if it was a stockinette knit sock. So same construction with the flegal heel. You can see that in the back. And I also used Jenny's surprisingly stretchy bind off here. And I did not block these because I don't have men's large sock blockers. I only have uh, small sock blockers that fit, you know, my size. So I think it'll be fine giving them to him. You know, they'll, they look fine when you put them on the foot. I may give them a little like steam block on my blocking mats, you know, try and pin them just to get rid of like the ruffliness of the cuff. But yeah, so those are my dad's bear paw socks and my mom's bear paw socks. Super cute. I'm hoping that they'll like them because it's sort of like a cushy, wintry, cozy at home sock. You know, it's the DK weight yarn, so it is very thick. I don't know how practical it is to wear these thick socks in shoes, so I definitely have in mind for these to be more of like a at-home lounge sock. There's all my socks. Pretty busy December making all these socks. I'm excited to put socks away for a little bit and work on my larger sweaters, maybe stuff with more straight stockinette, just a little bit more of a slower knitting pace than all of these. But these were super fun to make and they look good together as well. Nice color palette. <laughs> now we're gonna get into my works in progress, which to be honest, there's not a whole lot of progress on the projects that I had ongoing. You know, I put a lot of them aside this month so I could knit all those socks for gifts. And like I said before, I was also knitting a lot of hats for my Etsy shop. So in terms of my personal projects, not a whole lot of progress, but I will start with one that I made a little bit of progress on actually in just the past few days. So I have my oversized seasons cardigan 
which is a design by Haley Smedley, also known as Ozetta as the designer name. So this is a half fisherman's rib cardigan. I've shown this before and you can see it doesn't look too different from the last time I showed you, but I did separate for the sleeves and the body. So right now I'm just working on the body. The sleeves are put on some waste yarn as I go through the body. Now this project has been really slow. If you've knit half fisherman's rib before, you may know that it works and grows very slowly because you are working the stitch below every row. The length actually increases at like half the speed that like normal ribbing or normal stockinette grows. So it took me a while to finish all of the raglan increases and get to the dividing for the sleeves part. Now, if you watched my last video where I talked about this cardigan, I was super concerned about the armhole depth. So I had finished the written amount of raglan increases according to the pattern for my size. And I was looking at the fabric that I've knit and it just looked really small to be ready to divide off at the underarms. I was worried it was not even gonna like meet at my underarms. And someone or a few people on my last video had suggested that I give it a quick steam block just to see how the stitches expanded and just to confirm or deny if it would be big enough and ready for me to split off for the sleeves. So thank you for those tips. I did do that, which was a lot easier than wet blocking the whole thing and letting it dry. So I took my steamer, gave it a quick steam and sort of pulled on the fabric to see how it was going to expand. And it really did expand, you know, the fisherman's ribbing, it does compress on itself, but after it's blocked, it's gonna sort of flatten out and stretch. I didn't completely block it, so there are probably some parts that are more like opened than others, but when I was steam blocking it, I saw that it was gonna grow a lot and it was gonna have a lot of space for my underarms. So I just decided to follow the pattern as written and go for it. So I kept knitting, I divided for the sleeves and now I'm able to try it on and it does fit, which is awesome. Like success, I did not have to do any extra increases or any modifications to make it fit. I'll show you guys how it fits. Okay, so now I have it on and you can see that it fits pretty well and it looks pretty good. It's getting me motivated to continue working on it. It's kind of been sitting in a project bag in the corner and I have been avoiding it, but now that I can see it on, it definitely is a motivator to keep going. So yeah, you can see there's not a lot of issue with the underarm space and there are cast on stitches under the arm, so it adds extra space. I think I'm used to knitting more oversized, you know, positive ease patterns that really have the raglan increases go far past the underarm. So it has that very like baggy oversized look. And I think this is just a pattern that doesn't have a very wide underarm or very wide sleeve. So I just have to get used to the fact that it doesn't need to be so oversized to still fit. So yeah, this is the cardigan on. Let me see if I can show the back. But yeah, super nice. This is a pretty finicky project to work. Like you can see as I'm handling it, it's like all over the place. And I think that's also why I don't love working on it, even though I really want to get it done. So the button band is knit simultaneously with the cardigan. So really cool construction. It looks super neat. This is a one by one ribbed button band, but it is knit at a smaller needle size than the body to give the ribbing more of a neater finish. So because of that, you have to have two needles constantly. So the purple needle here is a four millimeter needle and the regular needle for the body is a five millimeter needle. So you can just see me holding it around. This is like a, a mess because you have two double pointed needles at either button band. I have to have like a spare DPN to actually knit the button band while I'm knitting this. In addition to the really long circular needle for the body and because it's a cardigan, it's knit flat. So you got a lot of stitches on the needle at once that are not in the round. So it's not as compact. I think I also have a lot of ends to weave in which may just add to the chaos that is this whip. Maybe if I weave in the ends, it'll like tame it and make it seem a little bit better. But yeah, this is not a portable project. I really have to have it arranged correctly to work on it. So I can't really bring it anywhere. And it's just a little finicky. So 
I don't know. I know that the finished project is going to be gorgeous because I'm loving working with this yarn. I'm knitting it with Lana Grossa Cool Merino, which the ball has kind of exploded on my lap. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll have to fix that later. But this is Lana Grossa Cool Merino. Very attractive in this bundle, of course. Anyway, so it's a chainette yarn. It's 90% merino and 10% nylon and polyamide. So it is really lofty and lightweight, which is awesome. And it has slight variegation. This is the color gray. And I just really like how it's knitting up. And it's going to be a really nice gray cardigan that I can see myself throwing over any outfit. You know, it's a nice neutral. And the finish of the button band is just really neat. I think these types of button bands look a lot nicer than the standard, like, one-by-one one rib button band that might be knit perpendicular to the stitching. So even though the construction and the actual knitting technique is annoying, I really like how it looks. So... Yeah, I'm going to try to get more progress on this. So hopefully next time I film a podcast, this will be a lot more finished. But we'll see because I also have <laughs> a lot of other whips going on. So we'll get into those now. So my next whip is the Hans Tolm sweater by Petite Knit. This is a men's sweater that I'm knitting for my husband. I am knitting this in Rowan felted tweed in the color camel. I'll show it up close. Really nice tweed. It's like this warm tone brown with some black, white, and blue tweed flex, which is like really pretty. So this is a standard raglan sweater. It had some German short row shaping to raise the back. It's got a double folded collar with one by one rib, and I'm just on the body. So I just got to knit straight stock in it for a while and then I'll go to the sleeves. This is definitely more of like a meditative knit, you know, can just pick it up whenever I work on it. So again, I'm hoping to have this done somewhat soon. I am trying to like get through these projects because if you watch my 2023 plans video, I have a lot of <laughs> new projects that I'm super eager to cast on, but I'm trying to have some self-control and try to finish some projects before I cast on new stuff. So the new projects that are pending is like my motivator to finish these projects. This one, the yarn is on the scratchy side. So I am going to have to wash it at least once, maybe twice, just to soften it up when it's all done before I give it to my husband to wear. Again, he's probably going to have to wear like a long sleeve t-shirt underneath for a little while while the fibers soften up. I've heard that this yarn does soften up with time. So We'll see. The next whip, I don't think there's been any progress on since last time I filmed it. So this is my Terrazzo sweater by Petite Knit. This is Knit in Hobby's Winter Glow. I believe the color is number 27 and it's this beautiful self-striping variegated yarn. I'm just holding this yarn single. I'm not holding it with a mohair or anything. I finished the yoke. You know, it had really cool saddle shoulder construction. Just got a knit stock in it for the body, then go back to the sleeves, the collar. So there's this project. Okay, so the last work in progress I haven't shown you guys before, and this is probably my oldest whip. I was checking my Ravelry project page and I didn't realize I started this in May of 2021. So we are well over a year, kind of close to two years of this whip. And I am pretty much done with it. So this is the... This is the Casper Blouse by Colibri by Joanna. So this is a knit blouse. It has this nice ruffle hem and it has these really cool puff sleeves. You can see it's kind of open in the back. So I am done with the knitting, but I need to add buttons. So I don't know if this will show very well, but if you can imagine that this is the back, but the two edges will be connected by buttons and then therefore you have like a, a completed sweater. So I knit this in Lana Grossa Eco Puno in the color brown. Eco Puno is kind of an interesting yarn blend. It is 72% cotton, 17% wool, and 11% alpaca. And it is a netted yarn, so it's not like spun. I think it's closer to a chainette yarn and really interesting. It was the yarn that was called for in the pattern. I started this project back in 2021, you know, back when I didn't really know much about fibers or gauge. So I was just following what the pattern had written. 
and pretty interesting texture. It is pretty soft, but it does have kind of like that sticky texture, like the yarn sticks to itself because it's kind of on the fuzzy side. And other things I like about this pattern is how it has all these moss stitched edging details. So where places you normally would have ribbing in a pattern, the designer decided to do moss stitch. For example, we have the sleeve cuff here. This is the collar. The back row for the button band is in moss stitch. And this is sort of like a crew neck. So I'll go like that and it has the nice flowy sleeves. This yarn does have a ton of drape. So Eco Puno is a sport weight yarn, but this pattern was knit in size four and a half millimeter needles. So lots of drape in the fabric. It is sort of on the see-through side. So when I wear this, I would totally need to wear like an undershirt or like a cami underneath just cause it's not very dense. So overall, this project had a lot going on. It was definitely teaching me a lot at the time. I think I knit most of this in 2021 and I had finished knitting it not that long ago. I think I was just sitting on blocking it. It was just sitting at the bottom of my project bag waiting to be blocked. I think my lack of motivation for finishing it was just cause my style interest in wearing the finished object had changed. Like I don't really see myself wearing the ruffly oversized sleeve blouse anymore. Unlike when I decided to purchase the pattern and knit the pattern, I thought it was a really cool looking top. It still is a real, really cool looking top. It just doesn't really fit my current style. So I'm still sitting on getting the buttons and sewing them on. I don't know if I'm going to wear it that often. So I'm kind of undecided on what to do with it. I don't really know what a lot of people do with their finished knits if they decide they don't want them anymore because a lot of pattern designers don't allow sales of finished knits. I don't know if people give them to family members that they know would wear them. So I gotta look into like, if I decide that I don't want this finished piece, like how to make sure it, in its next life by its next owner that it's appreciated and worn. Um, and also they know how to take care of it. So if you have any experience with that, you know, if anything, I feel like selling it is not because I would want to like make a profit on it. I would just kind of want to recoup maybe the money that I spent on the yarn for it. Um, but if I were to sell it, you know, the buyer would be someone who wants it. So I'm not really sure what people do with their knits that they don't want, but they do want to be appreciated in the end. So yeah, that's this whip. I feel like it's kind of sad because I don't really want to wear it, but excellent pattern if this is your style. Definitely recommend the pattern, very well written. It was a lot of fun to knit. All right, now we'll get into some new yarn that I got as well as some things that I got for Christmas that I asked for and are knitting related and I'm super excited to share. So the first thing that I got, I actually got like one day after I filmed my last podcast. So. I think I got it in November, but it's here in the December podcast. So that was my Sorella Yarn Autumn in New York collection. So it got shipped in this super cute box and back in the summer, I believe it was August or July, Sorella announced that they were collaborating with Two of Wands, who is one of my favorite knitwear designers. And Two of Wands lives in New York. I know she kind of bounces between New York City and upstate New York. so. They wanted to do a New York City themed collection with her and as soon as I knew that they were gonna release those yarns that I had to get some. So they released the colors in August. It was a pre-order. The order turnaround time was gonna be determined by how many orders they got. So after the pre-order closed, they announced that the order time was going to be about 12 weeks. So fast forward to November when my shipment arrived. So super cute packaging. I'll show you what I got. Now this is actually my first Sorella yarn purchase, although you've seen that I've used their yarn since then because I got the autumn tonals like after I had ordered these and the autumn tonals were in stock, ready to ship, not a pre-order. So those came before these came, but here's my box of yarn. So one of the first things that I got was a sweater quantity of the color townhouse. So this is in the classic DK base, which is a 100% superwash merino DK yarn. This is a 100 gram skein, about 231 yards. So I got a sweater quantity of this. Now it's hard to see like the color 
of it. It is like a creamy neutral and there's some variegation. I went back to their Instagram to sort of get the description of the yarn colors or the inspiration for the yarn colors. So let me read you what the inspo for this skein is. So townhouse inspired by the limestone buildings that sparkle all over New York, paired with city sidewalks, dark front door wood tones, and all the autumnal shades of leaves. Hard to see, but it kind of has some very faint sort of blush variegation. You can see more significantly like right at the bottom of the skein, the color differences like between this part and that part. The swatches that they posted on Instagram show more of the variegation. So I'll probably overlay one here so you can see. I was just very excited to get a very subtly variegated neutral color because I really want to make just like an everyday sweater that I could layer with colored jackets or patterned scarves and this would be a great neutral base. I do have a few ideas for patterns, although I haven't like committed one to the yarn. The petite knit no frills sweater is kind of that sweater vibe that I'm thinking of. You know, there's no frills. That's why the pattern is called that. So just a basic crew neck sweater. The DK weight I think will create a nice fabric for everyday wear. Another pattern that I have in my library that I would be excited to use is the Pippin sweater by the Knit Pearl Girl. The Pippin sweater is a textured sweater with knit and pearl stitches. I think it's called the sand stitch that the sweater is made of. And it's a raglan crew neck and I think it would highlight the slightly variegated yarn nicely. I do want to swatch in that sand stitch to see how it looks and then I'll kind of make my decision if I want to go towards that direction for the yarn or if I want to stick with just like a plain stockinette sweater. I got two other skeins as well. So this first skein is called Theater. Now this is a beautiful rosy kind of mauve tonal and it is also in the classic DK base. Show you that, really gorgeous. And then I also got the color Nolita, which is a sort of cream base with blush variegation, more dramatic of course than the first skeins I showed you. Like this has clear color of the pink where this is like a lot more subtle and I didn't even realize that these go together so nicely. So I don't really have patterns in mind for these. I think it's just nice to have in my stash if I somehow in the future get like the inkling to knit a hat or like a scarf, like a Sophie scarf or a little bandana, having these in my stash will come in handy. I could also combine these two, unsure, but yeah, lots of possibilities. Um, so I got all classic DK because I've been finding that I've been enjoying knitting things in DK weight yarn. So we'll see what I knit with those. And lastly, from the Autumn in New York collection, I did pick up some wool wash. So this is Sorella Yarns Wool Wash. She came out with a few different fragrances for the Autumn in New York collection that I think were supposed to be like both New York and fall themed. So I got the scent Sweater Weather. So I normally use Eucaland's Eucalyptus Wool Wash and that's a very subtly scented wool wash. It's a no rinse wash. So I just add like a few squirts to a bowl of cool water, soak my knits squeeze out the water, you know, you don't have to rinse it. So you just squeeze it and then let it dry. And that's how I wash and block my knits. So I was excited to get something with more of like an exciting scent. Sweater weather is, let me see if I can describe scents to you. I don't think I'm very good at describing scents. It's kind of like fruity, but there's also some like muskiness to it that sort of probably brings out the autumnal scent. Yeah, I don't know. It's nice. It's very bright and fresh and one thing I noticed, so I used it to block my shift cowl and I also use this to block the socks that I just showed you guys earlier. This is a lot more scented than the Eucalan wool wash that I'm used to. So if you are into nice bright scents, I would definitely check out the Sorella wool wash. I thought it softened up the fabric really nicely. It is made with lanolin which helps soften the wool fibers and the fragrance I find sits on the fabric so it lasts a long time. So if I pick up my shift cowl and smell it, I can still smell the scent. So if you're into that, 
I would definitely check out the Sorella Wool Wash. If you're not into heavy fragrances, then I would say to avoid the Sorella Wool Washes. They do seem pretty strong, so if fragrances irritate you or you're not a fan of fragrances, then you might wanna steer clear of this just because it is very strong. Instructions for the wool wash are on the box. Like it tells you to use one tablespoon for socks and two to four tablespoons for shawls and sweaters and it tells you to soak it for 15 minutes and then to squeeze dry. However, this is just on the box and not on the bottle. And I kept the box just to show you guys the packaging, but I do plan on throwing away the box. So I kind of wish the instructions were like printed on the label here, but not too difficult to remember. I don't like measure out my wool wash with a tablespoon anyway. I just sort of like squeeze a little dollop in the bowl before I fill it with water, so. Yeah, that's the Cirilla Wool Wash. I do like my things to smell nice, so I would totally buy this again because I do like the fragrances. So yeah, the Autumn in New York collection is closed, and so these specific yarns and the wool wash are no longer available. However, Cirilla constantly has fun collections out, so I would definitely recommend you check out their website. Right now they have their winter tonals in stock, and I know that this year they're doing like a big greatest hits collection, so they're bringing back a lot of best-selling colors from past collections, so if you wanna check them out, I do have a $5 off coupon linked below in the description, so if you click on that link, the coupon will be applied to your cart. Okay, so the next thing that I got was some Lion Brand Sock Ease, which I found out about recently. I'm on their email list, so they announced this, and it is a From the Vault yarn, so I guess they used to sell this, they discontinued it, and now they're bringing it back for a limited time. Lion Brand Yarn is one of my favorite yarn brands. They have so much variety and at great affordable prices. You know, they constantly have sales going on. So I got two balls of Sock Ease to try. So Sock Ease is a fingering weight sock yarn. It is 80% wool and 20% nylon. This color that I'm showing here is called Cosmo. Really nice pastel variegation, you got a couple speckles of this dark red, got blues, pinks, creams. I think it's, there's sort of like a yellow in there. So that'll be cool. This is the color dark and stormy. So you got dark navy, blue, sort of like an olivey color as well as some cream. Now this color here, Cosmo on their website is described as short stripes. So I think it's gonna give more of like a variegated look whereas this ball here is advertised as stripes. So we have short stripes and then stripes. So I don't know like how stripey this yarn is gonna knit up. I'm super excited to get these on the needles and just sort of see how it knits, how the fabric feels. I, I think I'm just gonna do vanilla socks with these because it's the variegated yarn. I think any sort of textured pattern is gonna get lost in the color changes. So this is a very affordable sock yarn. Right now it is online on their website for $9.99 US dollars. Like I said before, Lion Brand constantly is having sales. So if you're shopping Lion Brand on their website, definitely get on their email list. And I'd say every other week or so they have like a 30% off sale or 35% off sale or something like that. So you could get like a ball of sock yarn for six or seven dollars. This is a hundred grams. So you get 437 yards enough to make, you know, a pair of socks. Can't wait to share with you guys my opinions on this. If I like this, I'll probably stock up on some. I don't know how long Lion Brand is going to have it in stock for because they do say it's like from the vault and limited time only. So I hope I like it and I'll try and stock up before it sort of goes out of circulation or discontinued again, because this would be a great affordable sock yarn option. Okay, different type of acquisition, but I got some books for Christmas. So my wish list for Christmas this year was a lot of knitting books. I kind of want to build my library just so I can improve my techniques, see what's out there, as well as just have, you know, accessible patterns that are ready for me. I don't have to go on my computer. I don't have to buy them because they're already purchased. So we'll talk about them. So the first book that I got is the Vogue Knitting Ultimate Stitch Dictionary. This is kind of an iconic knitting book. I think a lot of people do have this in the library. This is a really nice hardcover book and it is just this giant encyclopedia of knit stitches. I'll try to show you guys what's in here. 
So yeah, there's just like an endless amount of stitches, color work, cable patterns that can be applied to patterns or like inspiration for pattern design. I kind of want to get into pattern design, kind of, I want to dip my toes in it. It's very intimidating, so that I think that's what's holding me back from it, but maybe something like this will sort of inspire me to get into it more. So, Vogue Knitting Book, it's really pretty. Like, I think I may keep this on my coffee table just because it looks nice, and I gotta put like post-it notes for the stitch patterns that I really like. That was book number one. So the next two books that I got are actually not knitting books, but you know, fiber arts all related. So the first book that is not knitting related is called Modern Crochet Sweaters. So yes, this is a crochet book. This is written by Janine Miska, and she's also known as Knits and Knots on her website and on Instagram, and I love her patterns. She does both knit and crochet patterns, but I think she does more crochet than knitting. And this book just has some really stunning patterns in here that look store-bought. They are really classy and I wanna make all of them. So for example, we have this like long line cardigan, super cute. Let me see what else. I also need to like put bookmarks in here. This like color block sweater and they're all crochet. So I think it's a great like entry level book for crochet projects and crochet garments. For someone like me, I do know how to crochet. I've made a few crochet things, but I haven't crocheted a sweater yet. So I think 2023 is gonna be the year that I crochet a sweater, probably from this book or a cardigan. I mean like, look how cute that is. That's so cute. She uses a lot of yarn from Knit Picks and Lion Brand. And I find those websites to be pretty affordable places to get yarn. So pretty cool. Very excited to dive into this book. So the last book that I got is the Tunisian Crochet Handbook by Tony Lipsy, also known as TL Yarn Crafts on YouTube. I watch all of her videos. She's awesome. I was super excited to get this book. And the best part... <gasps> It's signed, oh my gosh, so cool. She sells signed copies directly on her website. So I was, I was just so excited to get one that was signed. Tony Lipsy is sort of like the queen of Tunisian crochet. She has a ton of tutorial videos on her YouTube channel. She's designed a ton of beautiful patterns using Tunisian crochet. So I'm excited to dive into this. I don't own any Tunisian crochet hooks, but sounds like I gotta get myself some. So this is an intro book. It, gives you all the basics of Tunisian crochet, the tools, the yarn, and all of these patterns are sort of meant for the first time Tunisian crocheter. So there's a lot of cool stuff in here, like these dish towels. So you can see the texture, the textured stitches that Tunisian crochet makes is like unique. You can't get this texture from knitting. You also can't really get this texture from crochet. And that's why you really need to dive into this third craft. Although some of the stitches can look like knitting. For example, this bag here is made in the Tunisian knit stitch, which looks just like stockinette stitch. So yeah, there's a lot of tutorial sections in the book to really help you dive into the craft. There are patterns in here at the back. Super fun, super excited to get into this book as well. So now I have a nice stack of books to put in my physical library in my little bookshelf. All right, that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for watching and listening and hopefully knitting along or enjoying a nice cup of coffee. This was sort of a longer one, but I was super excited to share all of my stuff with you. If you haven't subscribed already, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. It would mean a lot and there's gonna be more videos to come. So thank you guys for watching.